This is Catherine Bears River Network, and I would like to welcome you to our third webinar in our series on integrated water management. And um, as you can tell, you all are on speakers, so if you have any questions for the speakers um, or on tech free to use the chat. Um, and when we finish up, um, Zoom, and you will get a post have you fill that out about this um, webinar today and help us improve our future. Um, so again, thanks for joining us and we'll go ahead and get started. River Network and maybe even River Network members, in case you're not. Um, just a quick overview of organization. And for 28 years, River Network has filled a really unique niche in the environmental community. Um, and we do that by focusing on the 2,000 plus river and watershed organizations that work at the local and state levels to work towards healthy rivers. Um, but like today, we also strive to engage a much uh, broader, um, we try to a much broader community um, like, like the folks we're on today. Um, our, we've, we're focused around three strategic areas, water, ample water, and strong champions. And we provide our community in any system through a webinar such as these. Um, via our website, our annual conference, River Rally, publications, and outreach, um, including direct consultation, analysis, support on the country. For this series, I really want to um, take the time to thank our, spo our sponsors, which include as well as the Urban Waters Learning Network. Um, and many of you today may be affiliated with the Urban Waters Network. For those of you who are not, as a peer to people and organizations working to restore and revitalize urban waterways and communities um, that surround them. River Network with Work USA, and it's a great opportunity to share experiences and learn. And so if you're interested in joining, um, we put the web in there, and you should be able to, to find out more, more links. So we'd really encourage you to do that. I would be remiss, of course, if I didn't mention that also that River Network, uh, you can join River Network as an individual group, an agency, and we really thank all of you who are members and supporters already and hope that others of you will consider joining and supporting us. Um, benefits for uh, River um, prices off webinars, training, River Rally conference registration, and access to scholarships. Uh, additionally. Uh, uh, access to pro deals and and insurance and other things. So please um, consider becoming a member. We'd be glad. And let's see this series. Um, so we started several months ago on integrated water management, and the reason is you know there were groups around the country on integrated water management coming from a lot of different perspectives. People trying to address. Um, Soaring costs, multiple environmental threats, climate change, and really communities looking for multi-benefit solutions that included. Um, uh, I'm going to pause here, just make sure that everyone can hear me. Um, so let's just take a quick pause right here. Oh, good. Okay, so some people can hear. So I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks for responding. So, um, so this water management is really to provide some case studies and chances for people to understand what's all the work that's going on around the country in this, this space. What does it look like from different drivers? So we've had a webinar that had to do with integrated water management as um, catalyzed on scarce too much on flooding and drinking water. So. Because when people in integrated water management, they often use a lot of different terminology. Sometimes we tar integrated water resource systems, so forth. And so as not to get hung up on a definition that we're using now that was put forth by some of our colleagues, is an approach to water management that centers on brown silos to create holistic, coordinated water systems that maximize social, economic, and environmental benefits in an equitable and sustainable manner. And so really we're trying to think about both the process water management as well as the substance. And those are the two things we've asked our speakers in this series to talk about is thinking about, you know, what were the substantive issues and outcomes as well as 
um, speaker and community manner and trying to combine those two. And so speakers really are we're asking in the engagement, um, equity issues, funding sources, tools, resources, how are they measuring and oppor opportunities for other communities to actually um, to actually put this in our so what I'd like to do before we introduce our speakers is um, find out how many people are actually with us and um, poll really quickly to ask you um, how many people are watching the webinar with you if it's more than just one or just you count on how many folks are with us. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Come on in. That's great. OK, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, okay, Ryan, I'm going to keep going. And the other part of this webinar series is that following this, we will be offering a series of small group discussions through the Urban Waters Learning Network. And so this is a chance for groups affiliated with the network or anyone else to join us. And so we're going to have a poll at the end to think about what aspects of integrated water management to just water quality, pollution, scarcity, or flooding you might like to delve into more deeply. And then we'll structure those discussions to experts ask questions dig a little deeper so these are the kinds of things we're thinking about offering benefits technical and anything else people think of so just keep that in mind as your last poll will have a better sense of what we might uh, provide more information so let me go ahead and our speakers the way we're going to do this is we're going to let both Michael and John on presentation, and then we'll have Q&A at the end. If you do have questions or clarifications that you need from the speakers, please put them in the chat box speakers and let them address to the end. You can have both of them speaking together and answering questions. I can get around to all of them for sure. So um, wonderful speakers, two different scales today, with the big and more city or urban scale, and so I think they've both got great stories. I'm really excited and um, thankful they were able to join us today. So first is Michael Garrity. Um, I've known Michael for a long time. He's currently the Columbia Basin Mitigation Manager for the Washington Society. We works on water policy habitat restoration. Prior to joining the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife in May of this year, Michael was the Puget Sound Columbia Basin Director for American Rivers, where he led negotiations on behalf of that organization. For that, he was also so law clerk for the Washington State Court. Michael holds a JD with an environmental law specialization from UC Berkeley and a BA in history from the University of Washington. John Scarpola is a manager of policy for the San Francisco Utilities Committee, providing 24-7 water and municipal power services. Previously, John was a program and project manager with the San Francisco Utilities Commission, where he specialized in sustainable infrastructure solutions. He managed the utility on potable water program, the first program in the country to permit and manage on site water reuse systems. He was also project manager for the um, at the San Francisco Public Utility Commission headquarters, first building scale black water treatment and reuse system in an urban area. He holds a BS from Santa Clara University and a master's in urban planning from San Jose. San Jose so with that, I am going to turn it over to Michael. Hey, thanks. The, the operated plan, and I'll start with we'll try and get into uh, how um, how the, how it came about from sort of a, a stakeholder perspective as I go. Um, more about that in the queue. Um, so just for geographic orientation, the Yakima Basin in South Central Washington State, it's the largest to the Columbia River that's solely within the boundaries of Washington. And it, um, it ranges from um, a pretty wet, uh, pretty snowy uh, climb. Uh, can, you, can you guys see my um, my little arrow here? Um, but up in the mountains to the west, up in the Cascades, down to a 
very ar arid uh, climate. Oh, I see how this little. So down here, it's uh, it's dry, and up here is uh, the headwaters, and um, you, you basically go from like eight, eight to down to like five to seven inches once you get down by the Columbia River down in the lower part of the basin. Um, the uh, basin has about about a three to four billion dollar agriculture industry. It's where about 70 crops are grown, and there's also a big uh, apple and cherry uh, and, and hay uh, industry, uh, sort of hay in the upper basin and the fruit trees lower down, peaches, apricots, that kind of thing. Um, you can also see that um, a large part of the basin is taken, is, is, uh, is composed of the Yakima nation reservation and nation as we'll talk about are, are big players in, in in the integrated plan and in the water of the basin another thing to note are these uh, there are five headwaters lakes um, rimrock bumping catchula cheese and cleellum four of those are natural were expected by dams rimrock lake is just a, was just a um, the goals of the integrated plan um, are fish and ecosystem protection and restoration, a more reliable water supply, especially for uh, more agriculture, water right holders, and climate adaptation, and all of those goals are embraced by um, all the stakeholders. One reason this has been a place where um, conservative captains of Washington, even though Washington is pretty progressive, more like uh, more like the politics are, are not that from Idaho, um, but some conservative county commissioners in uh, the Yakima Basin have. A Acknowledged um, the impact of climate change in the basin. Drought the last 25 years that, has, and you can see from this map that um, the Yakima is forecast to have some of the highest impact on summer low flows of anywhere in the state by 24, and that um, uh, that's also associated with less uh, water supply reliability for. Um, the water right system in the Yakima is unusual. Um, your water right holding all the water that, um, that they have rights to in drought years. Pro water right holders, as the name implies, can be can be cut off, and that's really where a lot of the damage from drought has come from. Um, junior water right holders are often and municipalities that form later, and they're, they're often able to meet their needs by um, water marketing because they don't use a huge amount of water. Uh, the, uh, I don't think I have a very good slide in here about the that now. Um, the, uh, so the, the my basin in, in, in the wake of um, called the Black Rock Reservoir proposal, which, which pumped water out of that in a spot that that was actually in continuity with some contaminated water, contaminated water on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation on the Columbia River. So um, for that reason. And it's eight, 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 that of our last moment environment. Um, and even some of the sector uh, folks in the Yakima Basin, some more 
irrigation that wanted to water sooner rather than later. Ending not just on flow improvements, but on habitat improvements and fish passage, which is bad, bad basin because none earlier ha have uh, fish ladders or any form of fish passage for the salmon that were that are native to the basin. Um, so they they got together and said, why don't we try a uh, more multifaceted approach that's represented by all the categories and elements on this slide. Um, and the uh, State Department of Ecology, through its Office of, the, of Columbia River, uh, developed uh, a plan with these seven elements as a uh, sort of uh, sort of a draft of the integrated plan that was incorporated into as an alternative in the state version of the environmental impact statement for that bigger reservoir that ended up. Um, so it it also has some roots in a uh, long, long time by 79, and this kind of is could also be a new phase of that. It's called the Kamar River Basin Water Program. The uh, elements I'll say that in addition to the tribe and the state and environmental organizations like American Rivers and National Water invited to uh, flesh out this plan in three local counties, NOAA Fisheries, the Bureau of Reclamation has played, ended up playing a reservoir proposal go. Um, and uh, the city of Yakima and others. Um, in terms of the elements of the plan, there's water marketing or water banking, water recharge, changing the way existing works, uh, new and expanded surface storage, which was the hardest uh, part for American Rivers. I was there to uh, to accept. Um, habitat restoration and protection at these five dams that. Uh, 20th century. Um, just quickly going over what what uh, included in each of those elements. Um, the water conservation in it because it's largely a rural and agricultural basin um, includes mostly irrigation infrastructure upgrades like lining and piping irrigation canals, on farm uh, conservation, and then there's also um, a municipal conservation component in cities like Yakima, um, which is about a city of about 100,000 people. Um, they're starting with some uh, changes with, with some xeriscaping, which is a pretty new concept in that basin on, on municipal property and moving toward um, coming up with best management practices to apply more broadly, um, especially if they end up wanting additional water out of this plan, which is still sort of in play. Um, Water markets have been set up uh, in the Yakima Basin during droughts before, but have only moved about um, 50,000 acre feet in a basin that uses about 3 million acre feet per year. Um, so another aspect of the plan is to figure out how to uh, make it easier to move water between different irrigation districts and from uh, and, and between irrigation districts and cities. Um, groundwater recharge. There are um, one sort of benefit of the pretty extensive irrigation infrastructure and canal system in the Yakima Basin is that water can be routed to areas away from the river and put into stilling basins where um, maybe in the early spring um, before irrigation really starts up. And then if it's in the right place, it could come in as cool groundwater later in the season um, to uh, cool the river and make it better for fish and potentially add uh, flows for um, in-stream and potentially out of stream use downstream. Um, another element is re-operating existing infrastructure. Uh, this is a picture of Rosa Dam. It's an irrigation diversion dam on the, pretty much in the middle of the basin. 
it diverts a, a whole bunch of water to power the pumps at um, Rosa Irrigation District. And if, uh, if the hydropower diversions could be reduced and replaced with power from the larger Bonneville Power Administration grid, um, it could um, leave a lot more water in the river at a crucial time for uh, federally listed steelhead. Um, I won't talk about the other project because it's complicated and may not happen. Um, the most uh, controversial, not probably not surprisingly, uh, aspect of this plan is new and expanded surface storage. I, I have uh, on this slide sort of which of the three 10-year phases um, each of these projects is envisioned to be in. But um, the first project is this Kachis drought relief pumping plant that would uh, use more, basically um, pump additional water in drought years out of an existing reservoir, drafting it lower than it's drafted right now, but it, it wouldn't uh, require a, a new or raised dam or uh, inundate any additional land. Um, there's a small pool raised at an existing uh, reservoir that would be used for um, fish water. The, the drought relief pumping plant would all be used for agriculture and, and it basically all for to meet the needs of proratable irrigators. And then there are these two uh, bigger uh, projects that would involve more trade-offs, um, deliver about the same amount of water as the drought relief pumping plant. But one is Weimer Dam, which is an off-channel dam that's been proposed for the middle of the Yakima Basin. Um, could potentially have some in-stream and climate adaptation benefits by capturing snowpack or rain that's snow that's no longer, or that, that, that in the future will fall as rain um, that isn't stored in the mountain snowpack. And, um, and it's not on the main stem river, so it's got some benefits there that would impact the, the site it would be constructed on. And then there's a uh, expanded bumping reservoir, which is down in the southern part of the basin in the mountains. And this, is, this one's controversial because it's some old growth forest that the expanded reservoir would inundate. Um, I'll talk more about how the phasing works in a little while and, and some of the uh, considerations for the environmental community and other stakeholders as, as that stuff was looked at. Um, there's extensive habitat protection and restoration that's included as part of the plan. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it, there's uh, main stem and tributary floodplain restoration, really extensive uh, floodplain restoration in the middle of the basin where the Natchez and Yakima rivers come together around the city of Yakima, about um, like upwards of 3,000 acres of uh, restored floodplain is, uh, is possible and, and is being worked on uh, in increments right now. Um, there are passage improvements in tributaries like creeks that um, have their own little irrigation districts and some of which have gone dry. Um, so passage improvements can be both from things like uh, from water conservation and having uh, additional flow or any flow in in the summer, as well as removal of small uh, removal or reconfiguration of irrigation diversion dams so that they allow fish to pass. Um, In-stream flow improvements from water conservation and, and water acquisition. Um, there's a goal of protecting about 75,000 acres of land, most of which has already been accomplished through the plan, um, through a combina combination of acquiring uh, checkerboard forest land from, from Plum Creek timber, uh, acquiring a 50,000 acre block in the Tianaway watershed that really was really ecologically important and was um, really important to getting environmental community support for the plan. And then uh, some additional federal designations under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act and the Wilderness Act. About 20,000 acres of new wilderness has been agreed to, which is a big deal in this on the east slope of the Cascades, and about 200 miles of Wild and Scenic Rivers. Um, here's a picture in the, the red area on this map. Let's see, where's that arrow? Um, it, right here is that 50,000 acre uh, acquisition of the Tianaway River Basin. It's the uh, largest free-flowing tributary in the upper Yakima. You can see that unlike these other streams over here, there's no reservoir on it. Um, and then fish passage. Uh, this is um, 
both downstream and upstream at these reservoirs. This is Cleellum Dam, which is the first one that's going to get permanent fish passage. This little slide here is a temporary uh, fish, fish passage, juvenile fish passage uh, slide. It only works at full pool, like you see the reservoir here is at full pool. But the idea is to build a, a multi-level intake structure that would take juvenile salmon and steelhead below the dam. It would be built sort of over here um, in an area that's covered by water at this time of year, and it would be operable. Uh, it have an operating range of about 80 feet with a bunch of different entrances into it, kind of like a parking garage. Um, and then there would be a, a adult fish, uh, adult passage facility built over here. Um, would be either a, it, it's difficult to have an effective fish ladder at a reservoir that gets moved up and down as much as this one. So for salmon and steelhead returning to Cleellum Reservoir, there'd either be a, a trap and haul operation here, or they may give this. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this whoosh uh, salmon. Like, hide, like salmon tube technology on any demonstrations of that, but they may use that as kind of like um, pneumatic tubes at a, at a bank that uh, salmon can be shot up over the dam, and it, it may actually work um, in, in this case. Um, there are also five other similar projects that will happen um, around the basin. Um, the results of the plan from a fishery standpoint um, would be going from about 20,000 salmon and steelhead returning to the basin today to up to about 400,000 after full implementation of the plan. A lot of those fish are, um, are sockeye salmon, which have been extirpated from the basin. For, uh, they were extirpated as of, of about 1910. And the Yakima Nation has already um, reintroduced and naturally reproducing run of about 4,000 to 10,000 fish above um, the reservoir, above the dam that I was just showing. And that reservoir, as permanent fish passage is put in place, is probably capable of supporting at least 50,000 sockeye. Um, but there are also endangered steelhead that will benefit greatly from restored habitat in places like the Tianaway and Better Flows and uh, Chinook and Coho and uh, bull trout as well that will be benefit from the plan. Um, there will be protection of watersheds like the Tianaway um, and through some of the federal designations. And then the goal is that even in drought years that proratable irrigators won't see more than a 30% uh, cut in their water deliveries, which is basically adequate for them to get by in a, in a dry year as well as um, a reliable water supply for for communities. Using of the plan, practical and uh, retaining the environmental community in particular. Um, those large phases beyond that would require separate authorization would need separate, um, federal authorization to proceed. Um, phase one includes that uh, drought relief pumping plant at the existing reservoir, um, fish dam that we were looking at on the previous site and dam in the basin, a pool, small pool raise at the dam designation of three rivers in the Cleellum watershed as well as 60 miles uh, of uh, conservation of about 70,000 acre feet and then um, significant habitat um, such as floodplain rest and the removal of, of, of a, the mouth of the river that causes temperature issues. Let's see here. Uh, and where we are and where we're going. The state of Washington has given 62 million uh, to date. 800 million of that was for that runaway watershed acquisition. Uh, another state will be requesting about another 30 million <clears throat> this year for the next uh, legislative, for the next biennium in the state. Um, 
about it's a little because there are a lot of tools, some of which you could consider you wouldn't because of other mitigation obligations in the Columbia Basin and 50 million in federal funding to date. There's a, a legislation in Congress right now energy bill that would authorize the first phase of the integrated plan. Per, the main thing that needs new authorization is the Kachis drought relief pumping plant that may, uh, and as well as some water conservation on the Yakima Nations uh, irrigation district, which is a project which is called the Wapato Irrigation Project. Um, that could move in the lame duck session after the elect of Congress after the election, um, depending on what happens to the energy bill overall and what Congress is, what, whether they want to do any work after the election. Um, the, uh, there will be continuing state um, and federal funding requests, and there's a uh, environmental impact statement process currently under underway for um, the Kachis drought relief pumping plant. And I should say that in addition to the state and federal funding, one of the things what, that has made this viable politically, especially on the federal level and with the environmental community, is that um, the uh, irrigators and any, pro any project beneficiaries have agreed that at least in phase one, and I think this sets a precedent that will probably hold into future phases, that they will pay for the construction of any water, water supply projects, including the Kachis drought relief pumping plant. Um, and that um, that serves as a sort of a, a check against building above demand and, and a capacity to pay, make and put uh, water conservation and water water making more on an equal footing than historically with water storage and that American Rivers was comfortable with this as well. well a lower impact project than later years. Um, the tougher burdens could be made depending on demand capacity, including how much snowpack has gone away and how much it may be needed not only for out of stream supply. sufficient to continue to support native species like salmon and steelhead. Um, and that is all I've got. Great, Michael, thank you so much. Um, see, someone is typing, so I don't know if that's going to be a clarification question, um, but overall we're planning to keep questions to the end. So I know we have a few more folks join us since we did our introduction, but um, we'll be turning it over to John with San Francisco Public Utilities Commission in just a second, um, listening to his presentation and then doing questions for um, both of our presenters at the same time. So Michael, that was great. Thank you very much. So let's go ahead and switch over to um, John's presentation and get started with that one. So, and this is great because we just heard a really basin federal involvement and then now what we're going to hear about is a much different scale program. And so, John, whenever you're ready, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, John Scarpula from the SFPUC. Uh, happy to be here to talk about uh, our non-potable water program. Um, so just as a quick bit of background, the SFPUC, uh, we provide uh, water about 2.7 million people um, here in the Bay Area. We serve the entire uh, city and county of San Francisco, and then we provide water to some of our neighboring counties as well. Uh, uh, greenhouse gas free uh, hydroelectric uh, power to the city of San Francisco, and we also provide uh, to the approximately 800 live within San Francisco. So um, there's supposed to be an image here, but I think we had some technical difficulties. Um, but as we've, uh, you know, begun to make uh, large capital, capital improvements to our water, wastewater, and power infrastructure, we really have a responsibility to maximize the use of our uh, the precious resources entrusted to our care. 
taking a, a one water approach to treatment. Where water management was done in silos, uh, we were making a concentrated effort to move to a holistic approach to planning. Um, considered synergies between water and wastewater system operations, and actually the role that, that uh, the energy from a generation and consumption standpoint takes. But this, this one water has continued to improve our efficient use of all our resources and use the right water use. And so following up on, on the right water for, right, for the right use um, analogy here, uh, one example is, is this non-potable water program that I'm going to discuss here today. If you want to know more about our, our One Water SF vision, uh, you can go to our website, which is www.sfwater.org uh, backslash uh, One Water SF. So, um, you know, I'm going to focus on our non-potable water program here today, but we also have three other uh, very successful programs. We have a water conservation program. Our, our current um, water use per day for a San Francisco resident is about 44 gallons per day per person. Uh, it's very low here in California. Um, we also have a groundwater program where we're blending groundwater from within San Francisco to our existing uh, surface water supplies, about 4 MGD, um, and that's, that's for potable purposes. We also have a recycled water program where we're providing recycled water for irrigation of our, our large parks and golf courses in San Francisco, and then our non-potable water program. So when I talk about non-potable water reuse, um, I'm talking about really five main water sources, but there, there are other uh, non-potable sources that are available within buildings for reuse. So rainwater, which is precipitation collected from roofs and above grade surfaces, and that's differentiated from stormwater, which is precipitation collected at or below grade. Uh, the differentiation comes because you're dealing with a totally different type of contaminant uh, structure within the water. So rainwater that's landed on a roof and maybe touched bird droppings needs to be treated in a different way than, than stormwater that's you know landed on a very busy San Francisco street where we're talking about coppers and VOCs and other type of metals that have entered into uh, the water. Um, we also uh, have foundation drainage here in San Francisco and that's nuisance groundwater from dewatering operations. So a lot of our, our high-rise buildings were built on um, you know, areas where there's high groundwater levels or there used to be historic creeks. And when they build their, their parking garages and their basements, they usually run into to groundwater. So traditionally, they've um, ejected this groundwater via sump pump straight to our sewer system. Um, but we're saying that, that it's water that can be used uh, for non-potable purposes here within a building. Uh, gray water, which I think most people know about, um, but it's, it's some clothes washers, bathtubs, showers, and bathroom sinks and black water sinks and utility sinks. And many times, blue have not separated the water sources via uh, plumbing. So we sort of began looking at, at, at non-potable water reusage, at, really at the residential scale. So that's, you know, putting bales uh, and cisterns, extra rainwater for outside irrigation. Um, we have a a program every year that sells out where we provide ferals and cisterns to residents popular uh, for the last six, seven years. And then we also have um, a gray water program where, where we'll uh, residents of San Francisco free kits, uh, construction kits to, to run their uh, into their garden areas. Um, so those have been successful programs. But those are really on the residential scale. And if anyone's been in San Francisco, we, we definitely have areas of the city that are, are single family. A large majority of our city is in Manhattan. So a portion of our city really lives in, in larger buildings such as this. So what we had to do was you know, rethink how not only buildings but also could um, and produce water. So I think traditionally in water, at so these high rises, we've said, okay, this is a demand on our water system. But what we're flipping around and saying, yeah, it's also a supply. There's a, there's a non-potable supply that can be reused within these buildings and within these districts you know, for irrigation, um, for a host of non-potable 
uh, end uses. So when we were uh, designing our building, um, in, um, we moved in in 2012, uh, we really want to incorporate um, a, a water reuse system into, into our building. So the project meet our, our water reuse system and we, with a constructed wetland system. So we capture 30 employees. We, want, we run it through constructed wetlands that are placed. You can see photos there on the right. Um, if you're walking down the street, you just think it looks like a nice wetland. But that wetland is treating the 5,000 gallons Um, saves us about a million and a half gallons per year and reduces our water consumption by about 65% when you compare our building to, to uh, similarly sized office buildings. So when we were, you know, doing our project, we had a lot of developers and designers come to us and said, oh, we want to do that for our buildings as well. We want to reduce gray water or black water or rain water within our buildings for toilet flushing or for cooling or for, um, you know, uh, trap priming. So um, we, we got a lot of inquiries from these designers that just really want to go. What we did was we began looking at a permitting process and, and create a regulatory framework for every building to be able to install on-site water reuse, you know, here in San Francisco. And in 2012, we set up via a city ordinance, um, uh, we set up a, a, a permitting process here with permitted and regulated on the local level uh, via my uh, utility agency, so SFPUC. But mostly the main regulator is our San Francisco Department of Public Health, regulatory enforcement. 2012 is a single building. You know, one one large implement, you know, its own its own water reuse system. Uh, that went into law. Fast forward a year, we we kept hearing designers that said, well, we we really want to do eco districts. You know, we can can share water between them. And so to the board, and we really need to look. Are, are there any laws prohibiting from non potable water between themselves. And what we came to uh, to find um, was that we didn't think there were laws district scale water reuse system. So in twenty thirteen we amended the program um, again via ordinance, via city ordinance, to allow for bills to share uh, uh, non potable water between them. Fast forwarded again to twenty fifteen, um, which now we've been in twenty fifteen we had been in one of Routes in California history for about four years, and one of our board of supervisor members, um, he moved forward with an, introducing an ordinance that would mandate on-site water reuse in any new building or development project that is over 250,000 square feet. Um, so now, all new development projects over 250,000 square feet in San Francisco must install on-site water reuse systems for toilet flushing and irrigation purposes. Uh, 250,000 square feet sounds like a, a big project. Um, in San Francisco terms, it's it's not very big. Uh, our headquarters, for example, is 13 stories. It's about 280,000 square feet. Um, so, you know, we put it at roughly a 10-story building, 11-story building has to reuse water on site. Um, almost every new building that's going up in San Francisco now is is bigger than that. So, um, what we you know really try to do here is to integrate our decentralized water reuse systems um, into our centralized uh, infrastructure. Um, we've, if you go online, you can find our, uh, a non-potable water, non water system project report that's on our website that details some of our more interesting projects that, that have come forward and installed on-site water reuse systems. Uh, I just want to give a, a couple examples here. Um, some of these slides may be dated, but I will update them. Uh, the Hampton Inn, it's a hotel here in San Francisco, they are treating rainwater uh, for toilet flushing purposes in, in their guest rooms. Um, this, this is a slide that's a little outdated because it's proposing to treat rainwater uh, for toilet and urinal flushing, but this, this project is actually online. 
And this is our big cruise ship terminal. So at Pier 27 here in San Francisco, uh, when the big cruise ships come in and the, and the, the guests go through our, our visitor center, all the toilets there and urinals are flushed with, with rainwater. Um, here's an interesting one. Again, this is, this is online as well, so it shouldn't stay proposing. But this building is an old uh, PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, um, warehouse building where they, they have a lot of their shops and some of their, you know, their maintenance workers. And it's an existing building, and it sits on an old uh, river, the Mission Creek River that runs through underground San Francisco. And so when you used to go into their basement, they just had this little river just growing right through their garage. Um, and so when they did a remodel of, of the building, they said, well, we have all these toilet flushing demands you know, from our crew here. Why don't we capture some of this river water and use it to flush our toilets? And, and so they did. And so they installed a system, and um, the system now uh, sends the, the, the treated foundation drainage up to um, up the toilets for, for toilet flushing purposes. And it's, it's different because this is an existing building. Usually we see these water reuse systems in, in new buildings, not in um, an existing building. Um, this is our new, again, this is actually uh, online, so it shouldn't say proposing. This is our new public safety building. It's the headquarters of our police department and fire department here in San Francisco. And they treat and reuse rainwater from the roof, stormwater from the ground, and gray water uh, for toilet flushing and irrigation within uh, the building. And then here is an actual one that's proposing. So this large green roof you'll see in the middle of this uh, project, or in this image here, is our new um, Trans Bay Terminal. And it's going to be called the Grand Square. Um, multiple different trains and subways and, and uh, regional BART system will we'll all here to this, this central station. They have a roof on, on the top of this long station. This station, if you can't tell from this photo, is going to span about four city blocks in San Francisco. And they're going to treat uh, gray water using uh, have at our building here on the green roof. They'll treat the gray water um, on, in the wetland, and then they'll use it for irrigation in the station there. This is a uh, high building being constructed right now. Uh, it's an 80-story building that will uh, treat rainwater for toilet flushing um, and irrigation. Um, this is our Moscone Center uh, in San Francisco. It's a large convention center. Um, this one was down below ground. Again, it hits uh, high groundwater level. This is building, which has been in existence for quite a while in San Francisco, eject of flushing drainage to the sewer. So uh, quite a bit of water that could be used. So as part of the remodel that's currently underway, they're going to take they're use it for toilet flushing. They're going to use it for uh, neighborhood irrigation and the irrigation to other areas and other buildings for irrigation. And also, we set up a truck fill station in downtown San Francisco. We'll, we'll come by this station and uh, get get the treated foundation. They use it for street cleaning in San Francisco. Right now, they they use generally they they hook up to the fire hydrants, potable. So they're using potable water for street cleaning. So this is great, great that they won't be using potable water for street cleaning. Um, and the final project here is a district scale um, steam loop project. We have a, a a subway station that is built very deep down into the ground, and it ejects about 120,000 gallons per day of ocean drainage. It's been since the 70s. And so we have a steam loop that's been heating uh, to about, I think it's 40 or 
50 buildings here. And, and once they, you know, understood what we were doing here but, and, and also understood that they could implement both, you know, building codes and public health codes that are protective of public health, which is the number, you know, one critical important thing, fantastic. Here, but public health um, always trumps that. Um, and, uh, we created codes that are protective of public health um, that do allow these to go in to be placed. So I would say that was the biggest barrier is, is just um, you know bringing bringing folks that have you know aren't in the recycling world you know up to up to speed. speed on Okay, I've got a couple questions. I'm just going to throw these as they come in. Make sure we get from my Michael, use considered or inquiry management plan for the yet. Um, not on a municipal, um, like on a much more, uh, you know, non, not not what most people mean by. It. Water these days, there, there are some really interesting issues about what happens to return flows in different parts of the basin and where water conservation is really valuable um, for the river it might not be. Um, on, the, uh, on the municipal side, um, the, well, I guess, and, and more about the irrigation, basically, Some waste can sort of be tolerated in some parts of the upper basin because of districts, although you have to give evaporation and that kind of thing into account. But that's that's the kind of thing people are looking at, as well as some sort of in a and that can actually have some beneficial beneficial impacts on the stream. Um, on the municipal side, um, for the first of the project. All the water, out of stream water supply benefits are going to and not to municipalities, um, and that development of is whether it's conservation or or schools might be considered um, have been kicked development for later phases of the project. Because uh, it's not anticipated that municipalities will be going after water that are developed by this plan. Near-term actions are just more minor uh, things because they're not actually sort of getting anything. Uh, so um, uh, that's that's how it's working. Gotcha. Okay, thanks for answering that question. Um, Paula sent in um, and sort of broadened it out a little bit um, for both of you, but starting with John, so what's the impact of the on-site water reuse program on the mitigation of um, throw into there sort of when you all went to Program? Did you have a sense of, of whether there'd be a benefit to um, to environmental flows um, or the bay or any of the environmental conditions? Um, and then, kind of a similar question for Michael. It sounds like there were a lot of the modeling that happened with Yakima was very driven by understanding the stream flows and where where did that happen and and how did you get agreement on it? So let me start with John. Prior to our non-potable water program, which again was management program on the books, um, gosh, 2009 or, or 2010, um, which requires all new developments, much smaller developments, anyone serves uh, 5,000 square feet uh, to manage storm water on site. And so um, we have a storm water implements that, that that program, and they can projects can pick a, a host of strategies to manage that storm water, whether it's green or bioswales, or rain gardens, or, or rainwater harvesting systems for, for reuse. And so one of the great things about our, our, our non-potable events is that projects that had previously wanted to 
nursing for their toilet flushing or getting issues getting permits or you know getting a lot but when we created the non potable permit and immediately came forward that say, Oh, we want to manage our stormwater and meet this this storm stormwater, you know, rainwater harvest through this non potable program. We've had I know manage the program for the last four months, but prior to me leaving we had fifty one projects have applied for or built or are now operating on site water reuse systems. Of those 51, um, I believe 40 of them were uh, rainwater harvest projects um, that were implementing to, to meet the stormwater requirements. So um, I have not 40 and and then modeled them to see what the hydraulics of our you know our, our sewer system um, or have they decreased CS, CS here combined sewer discharges not combined sewer overflows. Um, but uh, you know, rainwater harvest projects are 40 of 200 plus projects in San Francisco that have managed that have had to meet the, our, our stormwater management requirements. And what our stormwater management team has, and unfortunately I don't have the data, they could tell you how much flow those 200 project plus projects have taken out of the sewer system during during wet weather events. How you know reduced in terms of combined sewer discharge the number of combined sewer discharges that we've had. Um, I, I don't have those numbers. Uh, uh, if you email me after, um, I can connect you with our our senior lead, Sarah Minnick, who, who probably um, would speak much better to, to that question. Okay, great. Yeah, we can do that and then share that with us. Um, yeah, and Michael, who, how did the sort of modeling of proposed impacts work in the Yakima project? Who did that? And how did that affect the process? We may have lost Michael. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, okay. uh, a, a lot of the uh, a lot of information or a lot of reservoir operations and river operations came okay, one from the nation, which operates the reservoir, so they had models for how those work already, and they also had um, the, the system operate set up on, on an in-stream flow program that had existed since 1979. So a lot of that infrastructure was there, looking at what how you would tweak the system based on the new actions that were under the plan, um, and then for those particular thing for doing that modeling um, there are also consultants hired by um, the uh, Department of Climation to help the work group um, the multi-stakeholder work group do its uh, sort of uh, evaluate different scenarios right so you have a lot of circle and information yeah yeah so it, it was a, it was fairly I think the the technical help that was hired for this process was able to take advantage of a lot of pre-existing information and model. Um, so, building on Patty's question here, um, for both of you, what um, is you know groups are thinking about how they might take on either projects like this or processes like this? Um, what in your process really allowed? Um, you to get to at least you know successful outcome, and and what questions should community members be asking um, if they want to do this, especially thinking that you know many people you two happen to be from the west, you know what's the application in other parts of the country, um, and what advice do you give people who might be trying to undertake similar processes and, and the people working together on these sorts of projects. Um, uh, our program, um, you know, specifically, we had a lot of support uh, from from uh, um, the office, elected officials, um, San Francisco's, you know, being uh, you know, 
the environmental initiative, so the support of the community, um, you know, generally developers and designers come out, you know, sort of against, pro you know, initiatives that are going to make their projects more expensive. So, I mean, our, it's very expensive to build here. Um, but with this one, we, we've, you know, had a lot of support from day one. In terms of its applicability, you know, is it's interesting because channel, when we sort of put out feelers and we're creating this national group of folks working towards on we'd get Texas, Arizona, mostly uh, uh, Hawaii active participant. Um, so it's really interesting in water rich areas um, of as, as areas where that they have you have and pushing forward just as much in terms of water reuse um, it's just the right thing to do um, really excited we're getting this in our water rich um, so you know we feel that that you know, we uh, we have a broad support across the country, and, and to be honest with you, the rest of the world has been doing this for a while. You know, in Tokyo, it's mandatory to, to reuse water on site in projects. In Paris, there's water reuse requirements. Uh, Australia, of course. Um, Europe way, is way ahead of us, to be honest with you, in terms of on-site water reuse. So, um, yes, we, we, we feel that, uh, you know, the success of our program can easily um, be shared across America and will be. And uh, it, it, it already is successful in other places. Um, great, that's really helpful. And Michael, before I turn it over to you, I a follow-up question that came in, John, for you on the issue of um, development courses, you know, um, related provisions. But to the given the cost of reuse, um, you mentioned being on from day one in the beginning, and did you find the participation? by interest or regulation or perhaps that regulations kind of have leveled the playing field so that developers can then incorporate use without worrying about getting priced out mm -hmm. so um, you know that it's a question to answer um, there's some benefits there's costs of course to implementing these things you know, when we were implementing this program in 2012, we already had people coming to us but wanted to put them in. And they wanted to put them in for two reasons. One was to meet the stormwater regulations. So, yeah, flat out they wanted to do regulations. All wanted to lead to go lead, you know, everyone is building to lead them. They want to be lead platform and show that they can charge a higher dollar amount for the purchases um, in lead platform. Going to make sustainability very important driver in most of the businesses that we see here. Uh, rest folks wanted to get to lead platinum, and to get to lead platinum, it's almost impossible to do so without some sort of water reuse system. Um, it's very difficult to get no points um, without doing so. In terms of you have to build to lead gold, that's so into building. To do water reuse, so um, that was you know one reason they want to do it. And, um, and when they tried to get permits to do it, they didn't know to go local or to the state or you know who's going to provide my permit to install these things. And so they weren't able to do so. So yeah, so creating the regulations that allowed them to do so, uh, you know, helped for sure, and, and it lowered their cost because they there wasn't the, the you know the, the Costs they had to spend with the engineering teams or, or their permit expediters trying to figure out how to get these things permitted. We, you know, our system, our program was voluntary from 2012 to, to 2015. So if you, it was just folks who wanted to put these systems in. Um, yes, they could put them in to meet the stormwater requirements, but there are 15 other ways they could have met the stormwater requirements. Again, green roofs and bioswales and rain gardens. It wasn't until 2015 when the law became mandatory. So now they just have to put these things in if, if you build over a certain size development. Um, there's, there is definitely a cost, um, but we, we've seen with these larger systems, uh, specifically district scale systems, they can you know get their ROI to you know under under you know five years. Um, in a single building system, that that ROI may be you know further out there, closer to 15 years or 
Um, ROI being so, return on investment, right? Yeah, return on investment. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's been a mix of folks wanting to do it, folks wanting to meet regulations, and now folks that have to do it. Um, and some don't mind the cost. Um, and obviously, you know, I'm sure there are some that know that this adds, you know, X dollars to their project, whether it be, you know, 200,000 extra dollars or a million extra dollars. So, yeah, it's a good combination then of then the external incentives as well regulations and the... Back to you, sir, that with the question we started with in terms of um, the looking back. Um, well, I said maybe the things that helped most in this in the year uh, 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 underway for some time to uh, bring some of the will basically make their operations environmentally responsible and efficient in terms of um, having had some federal assistance with um, screening irrigation diversions and uh, investing in some water conservation and water efficiency. Um, and then that the fact that there was this sort of, that, that some of the water interest in the basin really overshot with that big reservoir proposal. Um, allowed for a good conversation between the Yakima Nation and some of the more pragmatic irrigation districts and environmental groups and, uh, and uh, state and federal agencies about you know, what might be a better, more targeted approach. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of the more, maybe the more structural thing. And there's also, um, also in Yakima, in the Yakima Basin, unlike a lot of basins in um, in Washington State, it has had all its water rights, uh, surface water rights at least, adjudicated. So there was um, relatively high legal certainty among all the players about what their water rights were, so they didn't feel like they'd lose, um, like they, they, they had sort of the basic water rights at risk as part of the negotiation. So that was helpful. Um, and then I think the, uh, the way that the, it was mostly the state, uh, Department of Ecology that set up the uh, stakeholder work group that negotiated the details of the plan and ended up agreeing to it. Um, and, and that had a good mix. They, they were smart about what kind of personalities from all the different stakeholders they got onto the work group and how they managed dissension and how they ran a public process. Um, and uh, so, so that was all, that, that was important too. Interesting. Um, okay, good. We are, this is a great, really great session. I'm going to, I don't see any more questions, so I'm going to end with um, a final sort of one-two question for both of you um, before we get the final poll going here. And so my final question to both, you both is, I've heard both of you talk a little bit, mention um, climate change. And so how was climate um, taken into account, if at all, in what ways? Um, how did that affect the project and the outcomes? And also, how, how, if at all, do you feel like your processes addressed um, sort of equity issues within um, and economic benefits to a range of stakeholders um, within your service area or basin? So, so yeah, I can go ahead and start this, John from the TUC. Um, so, you know, we take climate change into consideration uh, with every program and project we, we do here at the SPUC. Um, and, you know, we're just, you know, we just had this historic drought uh, in California here, which we're not out of, and, you know, to us that unfortunately is, you know, how we expect the future could, could really truly be due to climate change with, you know, less less precipitation, but when it comes, you know, it's much, it's more intense. So, you know, um, we need to design our buildings, design our districts, rethink how these alternate water sources um, can, can fit into our larger water portfolio. You know, we know we're not going to be able to rely uh, to with you know, the amount of snowmelt in California. So, you know, this would become a more resilient city, a more water resilient city um, to, you know, a capture and uses 
So this fit right in with all of our, our climate change initiatives. One that I personally have struggled with, uh, especially because I'm on the policy and government. Some folks, you know, are just strictly in wastewater and water planning. You know, San Francisco has a housing shortage. It's a, it's a fact. We have the highest rents in the country, the sales prices for homes in the country. Um, a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of talk and pushing working class folks out of out of San Francisco. So when you mandate an on-site water or any product, that means projects. Projects, you know, as I brought up, it is here. It costs in the country. If not, we're, we're probably number two. Um, and so if So how can a, a nonprofit that's trying to build 100% affordable housing, you know, because not only do we have mandatory, we build, um, there's another word today, a roof ordinance which will require all all new roofs. So do you waive these requirements for 100% affordable housing projects? I mean that's one method, but then, then you, you know, you could have more of an equity issue because then you have only well-off people living in these green and sustainable buildings, and people who can't afford them are living in, you know, boxes that that have no solar panels, that don't have water reuse, that don't have, you know, wall-to-wall -wall glass that lets the sunlight in. So are they built in dated buildings? I, I don't know. These are very tough questions um, that we we struggle with. So. Um, you know, we'll continue to, to hone our program. Um, we have we have an ordinance going forward right now with the board of supervisors to, to amend our, our current non potable program, which exempts um, some but not all affordable housing projects um, from having to do on site water reuse. Um, to, to you know, these are 100% affordable uh, projects. Um, so it, it, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Interesting. Really thoughtful answers. Yeah. Um. Michael, any thoughts on this? Yeah. Uh, um. I'd say that on the climate change was is is really important in in. in sort of the motivating force behind the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan in a couple ways. Um, from um, the fish and wildlife and environmental perspective, um, uh, I think that Climate change both inform the urgency of working with with others to do do something because of the uh, impact of doing nothing, and that also so that on one hand and maybe led led to some tolerance for the idea of considering uh, um, new storage with some trade-offs. Um, and, and another thing just sort of on its own for this to in favor of considering storage in a place like the Yakima is that it's um, the transitional, what's called a transitional basin between, as opposed to a rain-dominated or snow-dominated basin. So, um, right under the historical climate, it's been on the edge of being of having a big enough snowpack to really serve as 
or for the snow to serve as significant water storage, that's going away over the next 40 uh, or so years in, the, in much of the basin. So um, if, if you're going to keep um, decent flows around and cool water and all of that kind of thing, some, there needs to be um, a, a combination of actions. I mean, some of it, could, it, including some hard infrastructure, also, you know, floodplain and meadow restoration and, and taking better care of the landscape can, can help mitigate for the impacts, too. Um, and then, and the, and the agriculture community, um, whether they're attributing the cause to um, uh, carbon and other greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases or not, they definitely don't deny that something's going on. So they're, they're willing to use climate change to help advance their, their, self, their interests, too. Um, on the equity side, um, well, and, all this, and, it, and it's been really interesting to see some conservative county commissioners go into conservative congressional offices and talk about the urgency of climate change in, in the Yakima Basin. That's been not something that I would have expected to see. Um, and then on, on equity, the, the Yakima Nation has played a, a key role in all the negotiations and a lot of the integrated plan is about helping ensure that um, their treaty fishing rights are met. So that's, that's the most obvious part of this on the, on the equity side. There's also um, significant public land access that has been assured through um, some of the acquisitions that have, been taken, that have taken place and some of the future designations that it'll, it'll help perpetuate uh, public access for everybody on public state state and federal public lands. And then probably a, a grayer area would be, um, um, you know, you're, you're helping um, a big farm economy continue in the Yakima Basin um, through these investments in, in better water management, and that helps. And there, there's a largely uh, Latino workforce um, on those farms. Um, it's not doing anything to, in, to make those jobs better. It's not taking that on, but it, it is helping keep, um, uh, keep that economy uh, relatively vibrant. Great. Thanks to you both. Um, really rich discussion. I'm sure we could go a lot longer. Um, uh, we're going to cut it off here.